Hi, everyone. So lovely for you to join us for this amazing Q&A for Reimagining Black Futures. My name is Samaha Ali, and I am the founder of Sisterhood Media. So this platform that if you're watching online, we are hosting Black Home Supremacy Film Festival, the fourth annual Big Ups. I'm also especially pleased to be hosting this Q&A because I used to be the former programmer of this festival. So I have handed it off to the amazing Angela and look at us, we have not only a festival, but also four amazing, or actually three amazing people who are gonna be in this conversation with me today. So let's bring them on stage. I want all the directors in the space today to you know, let us know who they are and the film that they directed. I will start with Susanna. Hi, I'm Susanna Morgani, and I'm the writer, director, and producer of El Cid. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Susanna. Olama. Hello, I am Olama Opara. I'm the writer and director of No One Heals Without Dying. Thank you for being here, Olama. <laughs> um, and finally, Annalisa. Hi, everybody. I'm Annalisa Lockhart. I'm the writer director of Inheritance. Well, it is so amazing to be sharing this proverbial space with y'all. Um, and also thank you so much for not only submitting to the festival and, you know, being screened, taking the opportunity and time out of your day to be here for this conversation. Um, you know, we have around 20 minutes to knock this out and we're gonna be not only efficient, but if we go over, we go over. So let's get into it. Um, the first conversation that I wanna bring up is, you know, the classic age old question, what inspired this film? Annalisa, let's start with you. Um, yeah, I think that I, you know, spent a lot of um, summer, the, where we shot the film was my family's cabin in Vermont. And I spent a lot of summers like playing there in the woods, even though I grew up in um, New York City. And I think that I was always like looking for this place to escape and like blend into nature and sort of have this sort of invisibility that I think a lot of white people who have, have traditionally have access to these uh, natural spaces always kind of automatically get. Um, and I think that, you know, unfortunately for a lot of us, that experience of like going on vacation or going to this retreat and then being called out for like being othered for not belonging there, um, um, access being like blocked somehow. So I kind of wanted to right, show a story about a family who has this house, has this land that they have taken care of, have like dedicated their lives to, and it's under attack. Their ownership to their land is under attack and like how they work through that. Um, and that's where the science fiction comes into it. Um, and sort of the, you know, like radical imagination, which is so important to me. Any um, inspo from us as well? Because the entire time I was watching, I was like, this is giving cabin, black people, hunting. Any inspo? Any inspo? Oh, us, the movie. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> uh, I, I think I, I started writing the film in like 2017. So I think it was before us had come out, but I was definitely really like, so excited to see us and I was like obsessed with it when it came out. Um, so I think that I, like I really vibe with all of that too. Um, yeah, I mean, black people, nature, period. Um, period, that's it. <laughs> um, Alama, tell us what inspired this story. Uh, well, actually it, um, like I had a dream. <laughs> Which a lot of my my pieces come from like either a dream or some kind of spiritual inspiration. Um, and I had a dream of a woman in my front yard who was like black, like the color black from head to toe. And she had these huge black wings. And she looked at me and she said, no one heals without dying. And so I woke up and <laughs> I called my um, my filmmaking partner, my creative 
Jacoby Frey. And I was like, oh, I got the next movie. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we we really just built it from there. Like we, we worked without a script or any planning or anything like that. We just kind of like felt our way through. I I love dream sequencing as a form of inspiration. Um, and I think it's quite haunting the fact that, you know, not only did you see this in your dream, but you also brought it to life. I think that speaks to the power of you and your filmmaking team. So shout out to you. Can't wait to dig a little bit deeper in just a little bit. Um, Susanna, you know, bringing it right to you, what inspired your film? Uh, so El Cid is actually about a young girl's arranged marriage uh, in Sudan. So I'm from Sudan and I grew up in Sudan and uh, the idea of arranged marriages are quite common in Sudan. Um, maybe not so much with children. Uh, so the girl, the, the protagonist is Nafisa, 15 year old girl, but it does happen. Uh, and it's actually a childhood memory of mine where uh, some of my friends around my age, 15 years old, were actually their marriages were being arranged um, and they were their marriages were being arranged by their grandmothers um, as a, a gesture of love, as a gesture of protection. So uh, I always found that to be a really interesting kind of story because no one necessarily asks the girl what she wants in this situation, but everyone wants the best for her. So, you know, it's kind of like a moral dilemma in this family situation. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? And I just wanted to explore that with this film. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I actually just want to smooth right into, you know, one of the most important questions that I have for you. All of your films really deal with genre and not being afraid to really dig deep into that, um, whether it is elements of you know snow falling from the sky or um, a electric current that allows you to be invisible or experimental pieces. And I wanna know for you folks, um, how do you see genre films not only animating black futures, but also animating different elements in your mind and bringing it to life? Alam, I wanna start with you because from dream to reality, I think that's the best place to start this. Um, well, I I kind of like stay in the experimental space because I'm trying to figure out how um, this art form that was really like developed by white men applies to like my life and my people. And um, so like, how do I tell a story in an Africanized way? How do I take the line and turn it into a circle? because in film school, everything's so linear. Like you stay on this one line structure and um, in all of the study that I've done about my specific culture, which I'm Igbo from Southeast Nigeria. Um, my dad always told me like, we believe in reincarnation, like everything's a circle, everything comes back to the center. And so how do I apply that to my filmmaking? And I've really found that like, a narrative structure while I can move within it. Oftentimes, like I, I am forced to, by many means, pull in like pieces of reality, um, the voices of real people, um, the opinions and minds of black women. So I, like structures kind of like, eh. So I just fall into experimental. Mm -hmm. I love that. And Elisa? Um, yeah, I, I think I've, I my writing has always t veered toward science fiction. Um, and I think that what I always loved about science fiction as a kid and all, like going on along with what Alama said, like most of the science fiction I watched as a kid was like E.T. or I can't even think of any right off the top of my head, but most of them, um, the lead characters were like white boys. <laughs> um, but what I loved about them was that um, it it's a genre that inherently looks for a solution to a problem. Whereas like, I think, you know, horror is like 
creates like the problem makes itself known and it just gets bigger and bigger whereas science fiction is like humans usually are like oh here's a problem we're gonna try to find a solution to it and expand what we think is possible and I, I think that um especially well in my my work I'm always looking for ways for the characters to come up with um ways out of their their troubles and their trauma in a way that like decenters um the like predominant western like, ways of thinking about the future and like what salvation is um so yeah in my film it's you know i think potentially a really complicated solution for this family because they um disappear and we can't see them anymore either. And that's like, I think for me, like an intentionally gray area that I wanted to explore because they needed to take the mode of survival that was open, available to them. Um, that was the only way they could find a way out of this haunting. But, um, you know, they shouldn't have to do all this work to like appease this like oppressive force. Um, so long winding way to say that um, I think that the biggest problems ten tend to, in art for me anyway, tend to need to think outside of like these conventional like reality solutions. Mm -hmm. You know, I actually want to push you, Annalisa, because and bring in mm -hmm. a big franchise, Marvel, and um, think about Wakanda and Wakanda is very, you know, hidden in plain sight, right? Oh, right. Um, and that is actually, you know, how they reserve their resources from a very hungry and um, colonial world filled with mining and, you know, modern day imperialism, right? And seeing, you know, at the end how the characters just disappear and we still see, you know, the door opening, the candle, the laughing, like, you know, the joy. Um, mm -hmm it reminded me so much of that same principle of Wakanda and having to hide to be able to, you know, survive. Can you speak a little bit more about that decision? Yeah, I mean, I think that it, it's, yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to articulate. I think that like when I thought about this film, like the initial first thing was really just like, how cool, to me personally in my life, I was like, how cool would it be if I could find a place in the woods where I could go into it and like disappear? Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that it's 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 also to me, the fact that the family is getting, um, is like being withheld from the audience as well. Um, and yeah, I love the idea that like they could be doing so many things. They are having a party. They're they're like cooking up other inventions, and like we don't get to know what they are. Um, but I also think that like you know, I think it's in Invisible Man. I might, I'm gonna misquote this, but he says like um, like hiding or like sheltering is preparation for a more overt action. Like we do need sometimes to withdraw, turn inward to like, like you said, conserve our resources and like build up again before we can, you know, mount another offensive or like go out into the world again. Um, and especially for this family that they're, they're being attacked so constantly. And for the dad, it's been like decades of this force haunting them. Like, they really needed to to go inward to like build that. And I think I like the Wakanda comparison is a very positive one. I think that some people have reacted really strongly and said like, well, why did they need to go inside? Like, why didn't the goat, why didn't they do something to the ghosts? And I'm like, that's what they had to do. So. Mm -hmm. I think there's something to be said about self-preservation, recognizing how much you can actually control in this world and how much you can control about the way you live and the way you live, the way you live your life, right? And I think that end conclusion is something that should be seen positively. And it actually reminds me of what Alama mentioned earlier 
especially about the idea of, you know, what this field comes from, a bunch of white men exploring and exploiting. Um, and here's a film that transcends this by, you know, really considering from a voyeuristic perspective, did we even get consent to watch this family, right? Because we are no better than the, you know, people in the woods, right? Yeah. So for even the family to disappear from us, it really takes away like, you know, this isn't, this isn't actually something that we even asked for consent to be a part of, right? Um, <laughs> I'm yeah. I'm really thinking deeply. I mean, it's my job, but I actually kind of want to bring Susanna into this yeah. conversation um, because Susanna also talked about consent when it came to um, her film, especially about the young woman, Nafisa, and how she's the one who's getting proposed to. So Susanna, I'm asking you the same question. How do you see genre films really animating uh, what you were trying to convey in this film? Yeah, um, I'm not sure how my film would fit into genre films, but it is magical realism. That's the only way mm -hmm. that I could describe it as magical realism. And it's really a reflection of a young girl's state of mind. So if you recall being a teenager or a young girl, your life is half imagination, right? Half of it is imagining what your future could be or what it, or what it, you know, you build your future in your mind all the time. Um, I think the older you get, the more you think about the past, right? The more you think about what happened in your life as opposed to what is possible. Uh, so for me, the magical realism in the film is really just a reflection of the young girl's possibilities, of the possibilities in her own life. And that's for me cinema, right? Cinema, you know, I love cinema verite and all due respect, but I also just think that if it's possible to show other worlds in cinema, let's do it. Mm -hmm. I love that. I absolutely love that. Um, you know, these are three, you know, amazing directors of some of the films that are in this lineup. But I want to ask y'all because not only are these standout films, but you're standout directors. What's next? Suzanne, I want to keep it on you. Susanna, I think Susanna's a little frozen. So I'm gonna to toss it to Alama while Susanna is buffering. <laughs> What's next for you, Alama? Um, I just finished a film uh, entitled The Importance of a House. It's a short two minute um, film and it explores like the body, the home as a house, you know, a covering for the body body as a home for the spirit. And um, I'm probably going to put that into the film festival circuit sometime soon. And um, I'm still working on this film theory that I've been developing uh, based on the Dikenga um, and other forms of African cosmology, the crucifix, the X and Y axis, um, going into Veves and other kinds of um, symbolism so that's what i've been doing wow i'm it's, i'm really excited about the next and i know you're experimental girl so that makes it a little bit more interesting as well and spicy um i will say i have a particular interest in african cosmologies and i think in Igbo culture it is so rich because of not only all the gods but also the idea of reincarnation uh, my fiance's Igbo context so i'm i share in the not only excitement but also the investment in this and i can't wait to see what not only it comes out to be but i hope you also submit it to the festival because there's a home for you here <laughs> um we have a new director into the space um adriana welcome um do you want to just introduce yourself to the audience um the the film that you directed as well um yes i'm adriana Sherelle, pronouns are she and her and the film that i have in the festival is 10 years and 40 seconds Ten years yes. and forty seconds. Yes. Welcome. I'm just in the middle of asking a question for what's next for all the filmmakers. Susanna, you had just dropped off when I asked it, directed to you. What's next? What are you working on currently? Yeah, sorry about that. I think it was my internet. Um, Classic. So, <laughs> uh, El Cid was actually a proof of concept for my first feature. Yeah, yeah, I did it. I did it the right way. So I did this like a, many years ago. I started writing a feature, and I just thought that nobody is ever going to give me money because you know no one will ever trust the first-time feature filmmaker. So I decided to make a short uh, about the same characters in the same world, and then now I am ready to get that money. 
period. Go after it. Um, can you give us a little log line about how, um, what that feature is about and perhaps may where it really relates to this short? Yeah, so uh, it's the same characters and it's the same environment as the cotton farming village, but the stakes are so much higher in which the girl is, the protagonist is only given two choices, an arranged marriage or circumcision. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> It's giving family trauma, um, but not only do I relate, I'm sure a lot of people in your audience will relate. So I'm excited <laughs> and I hope you get the money. Go after it and what a time to be funding such a film. What a time. Um, Annalisa, uh, tell us what's next for you. Um, just have to say, I can't wait to see that movie and Alama, I can't wait to see all of your movies and you have the best titles for films like just like the importance of a house. Okay, let's go. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm, I'm developing a feature um, actually even closer uh, subject wise related to black femme supremacy. It's about a mother and a daughter um, and the, the mother is dying and her and the daughter go into a, um, like in an experimental treatment center um, to save her and then things kind of go off the rails from there. Uh, Is it also, yeah. you know, genre includes a little bit of science fiction? It's very genre, it's very science fiction, it's spooky, it's got all the, all the yeah. wildness. <laughs> Wow, look at this. I'm glad I asked this question. Now everybody at home is just gonna be writing their list of, oh my God, this film's coming out. Um, Adriana, I know we, I'm gonna talk about your film just in a bit, but let us know um, if you're currently working on any other projects. Um, yeah, I helped my friend produce his period piece called The Inventor. Um, and it's about uh, black inventor Garrett A. Morgan who invented the traffic light and also the gas mask. So we're in post for that. And then personally, I'm also in feature mode, ladies. So y'all are inspiring me. <laughs> um, I'm actually writing a stoner action comedy starring two black women because black women are in the, the weed space and you know the marijuana space. And I just want to see us on screen being lazy and acting a fool and getting in like these weird predicaments. Um, it's kind of like my response to this big black excellence movement, that movement that's going on right now, which is great. We love black excellence, but some of us smoke weed on a Saturday and we don't do anything and that's okay too. <laughs> so I'm developing that right now. Wow. I'm excited. Look at this. What a space that I'm in. What a privilege. Um, Adrian, I asked um, the, your fellow directors on screen this question, but I want to also ask it to you. Um, how do you see genre films animating what you um, understand to see to be as Black futures? Mm, that's such a great question. And I heard some answers and they, they were so amazing. Um, I think the Black experience is just so vast and some of the things we can't put into words. Some of the things it's like, I, I saw a clip the other day of Denzel saying like, it's not a race thing, it's a cultural thing. Like why like black people should direct black stories and why Latino people should direct Latino stories. So as far as like genre, like I heard somebody saying something about an experimental film. Some things like that we can't say in dialogue, we can say in an experimental film, like a hot comb to the head or like grease popping on the stove on Sunday mornings. Um, those little windows that black culture has. So like with genres, it's important to utilize everything because something that can't be written can be shown or edited or cut or used with special effects. And I think that's like, the most important part is like, we shouldn't put ourselves in a box. We should utilize all these genres because our experience is not a monolith. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have anything to add to what Adriana just said? I don't want it to just be, you know, stagnant um, question and answering. They said some great stuff before. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all the things you said, like I still all the experiment, experiential things you said, like, about the hot comb and the grease sizzling, like those, I just could see those in mm -hmm. like immediately in my, in my head. Visceral. Like yes. Very visceral. And I agree, like blackness is not a monolith. 
And there are so many different kinds of like experiences throughout the diaspora. And what does that look like on film? Like anyone can tell a story about a black person. Hello. Like when you have the experience of being black and brown in this world mm -hmm. um, and being othered at every turn like that adds like a level of seasoning that can't be like, imitated, right? Mm. So like, yes, it's stoner film. It is. <laughs> like, let me see I, it. All the space <laughs> and all of the magic, magical realism. Like, let's see all of that. Yes. I totally agree. Um, so this is my last question for you folks. Um, and it's kind of a big one, so you know, marinate on it. Uh, how did you build up the stakes in your respective stories? Ooh. So all of your different films have very different stakes. Um, we'll sit on it, think about it. You know, here we are. I'm going to see who wants to answer this first. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I can go. Mm -hmm. So 10 Years and 40 Seconds is a black um, coming of age horror short um, about three black kids in Atlanta, Georgia, selling water on the corner and then a zombie apocalypse breaks out. Um, in short, the metaphor in, of the whole film is how black kids across America, across the world, their childhood is cut short due to like systemic racism, the school to prison pipeline, um, police brutality. Our kids have a different experience of childhood than other races and ethnicities, unfortunately, um, especially black Americans. Um, and they have to have, the, you have to have these very adult conversations very soon. Um, very early, I and mean, you have the adultification of the black girl. So, the stakes for my film was always their innocence, um, because as much as we try to protect our black kids, they have to face this reality that's just like glaring, right? Um, so the zombies, it was an easy thing for me because it's their lives at stake, but also their humanity, their innocence. These are three black kids stuck in the city alone, and they have to make these big decisions. Okay, do we go find our parents? Do we go to the school? Because we know there's food and supplies at the school. Do we go to our local local drug dealer's house? Because we know they got guns. You know, it's like, it's no more childhood. It's strictly survival. And that's a big metaphor for um, Black kids. It's like, do they get to have a childhood or are they just surviving at a young age? Um, mm -hmm. So instead of doing like a very heavy, dramatic film, it's like, let me throw some zombies in there. <laughs> so the Absolutely. stakes were always high from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, I love how they were just on the block too. <laughs> Susanna, yes. If you don't mind, I'll follow Adriana because it's uh, the same kind of idea that uh, the stakes are high from the very beginning. It's a 15 year old girl and you understand immediately in the first couple of minutes that this girl is going to be a bride this evening. The kids tease her with the song like it's a wedding night tonight. So you understand that she's going to enter into an arranged marriage. So she loses her childhood in the first two minutes of the film. Um, and then as you think, I'm not gonna give away the end, but as you think that her grandmother is protecting her all this way against the arranged marriage, um, something happens in the end to completely uh, turn that on its head. Thank you. Alama, Annalisa. Okay, so I, I'm thinking about this um, because I don't necessarily uh, form my films from a, um, like a, a climactic kind of structure, right? So like when you think about the X and Y axis of the cross, um, if you're looking at it, the, <laughs> the right the right leg is birth. The top is um, adulthood right. The left leg is death. And the bottom leg is um, becoming an ancestor in the ancestral plane, right? Mm -hmm. So in my film, we're kind of like pushing across each line, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's kind of like, um, What's the word I'm looking for? It's, every line that you cross is a rite of passage. So I'm taking the audience, the viewer, through several different kinds of rites of passage, like from 
um, a myth, mythological woman giving birth to her own bitterness, to a real woman giving birth to her first child, um, to women talking about these parts of their lives that have um, that change them in some kind of way, um, to a healing where women are like crossing over and transitioning um, and, and releasing and letting go in real life, um, all the way to like that same mythological woman who's healed at the end. So it's a very cyclical notion um, and there's pressure all the way through. So you, you get this, this sort of like dingo dingo, like this, the, the ebbs and flows and the ups and downs of what life really is like for us. I'm glad I asked this question. I'm, in, I'm enthralled. <laughs> Thank you for that vivid walkthrough. My God. Um, <laughs> like, I'm dizzy. Annalisa, please. <laughs> that was so good. How do I follow that? Um, yeah, I think, I think for inheritance, the stakes, um, well, you sort of see from the beginning, the, you know, the Nora, the daughter getting added to the deed to the house, um, is this like really jubilant moment? Um, the dad wanting to pass down some of his like wealth that he's accrued, um, the house, like which was very symbolic, giving it to his daughter. Um, and then, you know, I think the stakes get ramped up because to me, like the, um, you know, <laughs> the other, uh, the, the father and the brother sort of naively, like they didn't tell her that they have this sort of curse. Um, so they, I, in my mind, they sort of believed that by not telling her, they were kind of protecting her and that perhaps it wouldn't happen and she wouldn't be able to see these these spirits. Um, and she does. And I, I feel like the stakes for the rest of the family are sort of raised because they're like, oh no, like she's a part of this too. And that makes it worse for them. And sort of that like, I can deal with this, but now that I see that it's affecting my daughter, I can't deal with it, deal with that. Um, and then I think the ultimate like um, hammer, I guess, is the ghost burning the deed, which sort of, to me, it's like they were always on the outside watching, which was bad enough. But once they hadn't really crossed the threshold um, into this, into the house, into like physically taking items and fire, and that is like sort of the final straw. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Chills. I got to end it somewhere. I'm going to end it here because I don't even want to ask any more questions after this. I'm just taking it all in. Um, firstly, I want to thank all of you for being in this room. And I want to thank y'all for making space for each other to speak. Very important. Groundbreaking that some people do not do it. <laughs> But I appreciate that all of y'all have not only been patient and listened to each other, but also find, I hope find inspiration in this conversation. Um, I would love to, you know, wrap this up by getting everybody to, you know, say where people can follow them or find more about their work. Annalisa, you were just speaking, so I just want to toss it right back to you and go in the reverse order. Uh, yeah, um, you can find me on Instagram at Annie, like the movie, J Lo. Um, don't have an account for the, the film, but I, I could in the future. Alama? Yeah. Okay, me. Um, I just want to say, I participate in a lot of film festivals, but, and this is my first time in this film festival, but it feels like home. Ooh, it's such a privilege to be on this panel with y'all. Like, I cannot wait to see your films. Like, y'all are legit. <laughs> Okay, but okay, me. Um, we're time. Okay, so I have three films showing at Mint Gallery in Atlanta right now, um, and I'll be on the film festival circuit. I believe my 
we do have an Instagram for No One Heals Without Dying. And I think it's just No One Heals Without Dying short film. Um, and I am at Olama Lama, O L A M M A L A M M A. Perfect. Thank you. Susanna? Uh, yeah, I don't have a uh, an account for the film, unfortunately. I think we're all kind of just trying to do the best we can with with what little time we can. But um, uh, my full name, Susanna Morgani, uh, is uh, my Instagram handle. Perfect. Adriana? Yes, I am. Um, this is also my favorite festival. Um, I got to attend in 2019 when it was in person, and you all did an amazing job. Y'all are killing it. Y'all are brand new in the, the film festival industry, but like, it doesn't feel like it. Like you said, it feels like home. Like, and I was so excited to submit this year and so grateful to get in. So thank you so very much. And congratulations to you, beautiful women. I love this, I love this so much. Um, so for me, Adriana Sherrill, the little right here, that is <laughs> my IG handle. And we do have an IG for the, film is called 10 years and 40 seconds is the same um, as the title and I'm excited to watch you all's film and see what this festival brings. Period. Again, what a great space you've curated today. I appreciate all of y'all with your very, very kind words. And I also want to thank everybody at home for, you know, clicking this Q&A and I hope you continue to watch more films from the fourth annual Black Femme Supremacy Film Festival. Um, the festival will be running between September 5th to 11th. So make sure not only you get your short blocks tickets, but you know, might as well just invest in a festival pass and watch all of these amazing films. Um, you can follow the festival at BFS Film Fest on Twitter and Instagram and you know tag us on Facebook at Black Femme Supremacy Film Festival. If you liked me, you know, you're a wonderful moderator. My name is Samaha Ali. Again, I'm the founder of Sisterhood Media, the people who are hosting Black Femme Supremacy Film Festival online. And you can interact with me only on Twitter because I'm addicted to it at Sister Samah. And you know, my name, the spelling is right there. Oh, this hand. <laughs> um, have a lovely, lovely festival and thank you all for coming. Bye.